Hi, I'm Harley. So, la the. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I should start over, but I'm not gonna. Okay, so, GOT, season seven, episode seven. Couple of things. This is the shortest season of Game of Thrones yet, but this particular episode is the longest one ever recorded. Uh, it ended up at about a hundred or uh, one hour thirty one minutes. It's called the Dragon and the Wolf, and um, there are basically four main things that happen in this episode. The first and the biggest that takes up the majority of the episode, running at about forty six minutes, is the meeting in King's Landing. Nearly every single major player um, in this series is on camera at one time at this meeting. It's, it's pretty amazing, actually. And watching some of the behind-the-scenes footage that I get with my HBO Now subscription, um, I get to see a little bit of how they filmed it. And it's pretty intense. I guess it took them um, almost two weeks to film this scene or series of scenes, um, this like whole meeting thing, as the case may be. And... Uh, it was just interesting to see, but um, seeing all of the characters on screen at the same time, it's very impressive. Um, it's there's there's a line that Tyrion says that um, is is very apropos. We're all here. We've all shed blood for each other. We've all shed blood uh, because of each other, and uh, we need to put that aside. Basically, um, I'm paraphrasing. That's not the exact line, but um, it's. It's interesting because uh, Cersei does exactly what they thought she was going to do. Um, she thinks that they're trying to get her to make a truce uh, based on fairy tales and lies. And so bringing the White Walker to this meeting was, was the smartest thing they could do because it does get her attention. Um, unfortunately for, for them, though, Cersei sees it and... She sees it as an opportunity instead of um, instead of the threat that it is. Um, she still cannot get past in her mind us versus them. Um, us being the Lannisters versus the rest of the world, basically. Um, so she sees the White Walker threat as a way to eliminate her enemies. Let them all go to war. Let them either take care of the White Walkers and be done with it, and she will take care of whatever's left because they would be incredibly weakened at that point. They would have very little resources to fight her or to want to fight her. So she sees it as a way to be able to bowl right over them. And if they fail, there's she's not really thinking that she would go up against the White Walkers at that point or, or you know the, the army that has been built on the rest of the dead. Um, she just sees it as, a, well, then there's no one left to fight anyway. Um, there, there would be no point. And with her, with us finding out now that she's pregnant, which I'm still not convinced of, let me be honest. I, I want to believe it, but I really think that she might be making it up. And I, and I hate to say that as a woman, it's a terrible thing to do. Um, I don't, I don't agree with making up break preg pregnancies, but, um, so I, I just, I, I'm really, really unconvinced at this point that she is actually pregnant, but that's neither here nor there. So she wants to make a world where she can have this family potentially, but um, to do that, she also wants to remain in her position of power. That's the only way I think that she knows how to go forward at this point. So seeing this White Walker threat, um, she sees it as a blessing, I think. And Jamie, I think Jamie really is the one that sees it for what it is, that um, really to, to fight them, especially because he's, a, he's a, a, a knight, he's a warrior, right? So he's been to battle, he's been to war. He understands the cost of war and, what it, and the toll it takes um, and the, the, lar the amount of army that, the number of the army that is being described to him, he understands that that is going to take everyone, that it's going to take all of them fighting together to potentially be beat this threat. So I think he sees it, but... Um, he also doesn't want to go against Cersei, of course. But uh, I, I knew, I knew it was coming. I knew he would have his breaking point. She's, she would push him to do something that was so far past what he was comfortable with that it would drive a wedge between them. And asking him to break his loyalty, to break his word and go against his men, that's the point. 
And I think if she would have asked it of him before, it wouldn't have even been a problem. But the fact that she's like stacked thing on top of thing on top of thing that goes against his core principles. This is just like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. He just can't take any more. Um, so I really get the sense that she's going to continue to push. And I really think that he's either going to kill him or her or she's going to kill him. It's going to come down to the two of them fighting and one of them, only one of them is going to come out standing. Um, now, in this whole scene, we also uh, have Euron who slinks away, supposedly under the guise of uh, going back to his island to, to wade out whatever war is coming, when really Cersei has had this plan all along to send him to go get mercenaries. So my question is, are these mercenaries, um, is that where Dario is now? Like, Danny's former lover, is that... Like, is he going to be one of the mercenaries that comes back? That that was really like when I they started talking about that. That was like the first thing that popped into my head. Um, we also see John's damn sense of honesty and loyalty. So this is the thing that has lifted him up the entire time, but it's also what drags him back down. It's the reason that the people love him. It's the reason that they elected him or appointed him king or whatever. But in this particular instance, when he is so honest with Cersei, it's also the thing that fucks him over royally. Because now she doesn't trust him. She doesn't believe him. And all the cards are out on the table. That's something that Danny could have like kept in her back pocket that she had John like on her side the whole time. But now that Cersei knows, it's just one more card on the table. It's one more thing that um, they they can't, you know, they can't use it to their advantage. And sometimes John doesn't have that like, foresight to like see where where uh like the strategy of it, <laughs> strategy, that's not a real word. He doesn't see the strategy of it um, to see how you don't necessarily, you don't want to lie, but you don't want to tell the whole truth. And there's a fine line there that he's never really been great at treading, I think. Um, and he does say that it's his upbringing, that that's how his dad was, and that's just what he has been taught and what he believes. Um, but, and, and he acknowledges that that's what got his dad killed. So I think he's trying to learn from that. He's trying to not make the same mistakes, but still uphold that code that he has. Um, and it's very much like Jamie, where there's that code that, that there's just a line that he doesn't feel like he can cross. Um, and all of these characters are being pushed closer and closer to that line. And it's, it's really coming down to the nitty gritty of, okay, well, you're at the line, but you still have to keep going. You still have to have another move. So what do you do now? Um, so going forward, it's going to be really interesting as this war wages and as, um, the rest of them figure out that Cersei's really not on their side and not going to help them. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how all the chips fall. Um, so I think really that is the big points, the big things that happen, um, in the meeting. John and Danny have a private conversation, um, where Danny reiterates that she doesn't believe she can have children. Uh, John doesn't really see this as a problem. Um, I think with his upbringing, um, for him, I don't think that, like, I think he'd love to have children, but I don't think it's necessarily important to him that bio that they be biological. I think he would just take on whatever was thrown at him, much the same way that Daenerys has. So, um, but he doesn't necessarily believe it either. I think that's a key point, too. I mean, he's seen so much, he should be dead, right? So I think that uh, he is not convinced that infertility is really a problem. Um, but not that they even have time to really think about it right now anyway, or think about that, that possible future. Um, but for him, he's like, eh, well, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> but it was, it was a really cute moment where he's like, are you sure? Are you sure she was telling you the truth? So the next big thing that happens in the episode, uh, is there, there's a whole story between Sansa and Arya, um, and Littlefinger. Uh, this takes up about the next 15 to 20 minutes of the show where Littlefinger really, really is trying to drive that wedge at home. He wants to be Sansa's closest ally. I really think that's his endgame. I mean, I, I really just, that's the only thing I can come up with, is that he wants to be, make sure that he is Sansa's closest ally and potentially have a, a mate there. I mean, he, I think he, he really wants to be with her, but he understands that she doesn't ever want that so this is like the next best thing and I think he really just enjoys the manipulation of it of pitting 
people against each other that would otherwise be really close allies. Fortunately, uh, they're able to see through it, and he is taken completely by surprise um, when Sansa, um, you know, calls him out basically in front of everyone. I really enjoyed watching him go through like his phases of denial where he's outraged and then acts confused and when that doesn't work all of a sudden he's pleading and when that doesn't work it's like he goes through every trick he's ever played and he's just waiting for the next one to work because he figures he's never he's never been called out like this before so it's got to he's got to find a way um, and when it doesn't work and he realizes the end, what the end is, he's still up to the very last second trying to convince them that it's all a big mistake, it's all a big misunderstanding, that, you know, there's there's got to be some way that they can get through this, and Arya's just like, nope, we're done. And she takes him out, and it's great. It really was. Um, and it's, it's good for the sisters because they see how they fit in each other's lives now. They understand what they're meant to do and what they're meant to be. Arya has never wanted to be the lady. She's always wanted to be a warrior. And she can be that warrior that Sansa needs. Sansa can't be the one that goes around placing, she can, she, well, how do I want to put this? She can cast judgment, but she shouldn't be the one to uphold the judgment. Her dad did that and it didn't work out well for him. So it's again, finding that distinction between what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked in the past and how to move forward in doing that and, and make it work going forward. And having that separation of your leader and your executioner might be a crucial step going forward. It might be what keeps them all alive for a while. Um, moving forward from there, there's a brief snippet where Theon gets his balls back. Yes. Uh, he decides, when he learns that Yara is alive, um, he decides that he's going to go get her, that she was the one person that never gave up on him when he was at his lowest. She tried to rescue him, even when he couldn't allow himself to be rescued. He wants to do the same for her. So I think ultimately uh, it's going to lead to his demise because there's not really a lot of growth left for him, but he might be able to redeem himself one last time in the end. Um, and to do that, he had to get um, the trust of his people, of Yara's leftover uh, crews, like crewmen, to follow him so that they can go attempt to, to save her. It's a band of like, what, 20 people? And they're going to go against the rest of the Iron Fleet. So who knows how that's going to play out. Hopefully having a small number will work in their favor where they can be sneaky about it and sneak in and sneak out. Um, but who knows? We'll have to see what happens. But it was really great to see him just like take that piece of himself back um, and really uh, find his, his strength and a bit of his dignity again. And then... The final, well, not the final thing, but the last big thing before the final thing, which I'll go into, but it's not really a surprise. Um, Samuel meets up with Bran again, and uh, they get to fill in the gaps for each other. Bran has this thing that he's known since freaking episode one. Bran, send a goddamn raven. Just send a raven. Don't have to tell him in person. Just send the raven. Seriously. How many times can I say it? I think I've said it in every single one of these. Stop holding information back. Stop keeping it to yourself. Let it be known. Shout it from the sky if you must. I mean, it's just ridiculous at this point. But Bran tells Samwell that he knows who John's parents are. Samwell lets Bran know that he, he that John is not a bastard, that he was made in uh, matrimony, that uh, Rhaegon and Lyanna loved each other and were secretly married and secretly wed. And he is the rightful heir to the throne. And the thing is, I've seen a bunch of things online where they're like, ooh, this is going to throw a dagger in the heart, of, in Danny's heart. I really don't think so. Here's the thing. John doesn't want to be a king. It's the thing that, like, nobody understands. He's been appointed the king, but he doesn't want it. So unless it's forced upon him, he's going to let Daenerys have it, especially because he likes her. I mean, it's very obvious at this point what his feelings are towards her. And if he was to be king and she wants to be queen, they could just get together. I mean, for the love, his, would it be his grandfather and his grandmother were brother and sister? Zelda, you're not helping. Lay down. So, I mean, it wouldn't be unheard of for an aunt and her nephew to be married and be king and queen. 
It's not unheard of. It might be icky from our standards, but in this world of Westeros, it's not the craziest thing that's ever occurred. I mean, there's this whole, like, we know that Jamie and Cersei have been sleeping together forever, and there's rumors about it. So even the common people know that this brother and sister thing is happening. So having them together, I don't, maybe it's like beyond me. Maybe I'm missing something, but I just, I don't see how it's as big a deal as everyone is really making it. I mean, other than like in real life, it's icky, but in this world, in the storyline, it's, it's actually much more separated out than some of the other affairs that we've seen. So um, the, we find out that Robert's Rebellion is built on a complete lie, um, which has got to have some repercussions of some sort, right? Um, and so it, it's just at this point, I'm so frustrated that they're just that John still doesn't know. It's been a whole freaking season, a whole freaking season that John still doesn't know. And I understand there's been a lot going on, but someone could have done something. If you don't want him to know by a letter or whatever, you've got plenty of men that can obviously travel on horseback pretty quickly. They can tell him. I mean, it doesn't have to be a certain person that tells him, right? It would be nice, but I just, I I don't know. I, it's it's just one of those things. That I, I find myself screaming at the screen every time they talk about it. Sam's reaction, though, is really great. I loved it when he walks in and he's like, Bran, how have you been? And Bran's like, I, I've become the three-eyed raven. He's like, oh, sure. I don't know what that means. <laughs> And his explanation is pretty great, where he's just like, well, I can see everything now. I'm in all places at all times, which I've come to learn it's more like him being, um, it, it, he's described it, the, the kid that plays Bran, he's described it as him having access to every book that's ever been written, every encyclopedia, everything, but he hasn't had the time to read them all yet. So if he wants to know a fact, he can go look it up. He can go see it for himself, but he hasn't had the time to like, read all the books, watch all the stories, watch all the movies. So when Sam was like, can you see that? And he goes and he sees the wedding, then it's like, oh yeah, that did happen. But until he wants to see it, it's not just known to him. He has to seek it out, so to speak. So that's why not all of these things are obviously like overtly apparent to Bran. So the last and biggest thing that happened, obviously, was that the dragon attacks Eastwatch, melts the wall, blue fire. I knew it was going to be blue fire because I don't know why, but if his eyes change color to blue, then obviously his fire had to be changed to blue, right? So the army of the dead is marching past the wall at Eastwatch and it's on its way. And that's where the season ends, right there. Um, we don't know who at Eastwatch is still alive. I don't think everyone is dead. Um, I hope that they bring Tormund back. Tor Tormund? Torrigan? You know who I'm talking about. The red-haired dude. He's funny. He's hilarious. He wants to be with Brienne. I would love to see where that goes, but um, hopefully not everyone is dead. Hopefully there's someone there to tell. Um, and again, this Eastwatch is huge, right? It's this huge tower. So obviously they see this dragon come up. Everybody's in shock, but somebody has to ride away to tell them what's happening. Somebody has to be like smart enough to be like, holy crap, there's a dragon. It's blowing fire. Let me run. I understand everything happened really fast. I get it. But if you're at the bottom of the tower and you see something happening at the top of the tower, get on your damn horse and go tell someone. Seriously. Again, send a goddamn raven. It's not hard, right? I don't know. It, that, that's my frustration right there in a nutshell. And you can disagree with me if you want. These are my feelings. It's cool. I can take it. Let me know what you think. Season seven was amazing. We have to wait a whole freaking year for season eight. And I, I've heard it's only going to be six episodes, that it's going to be super short, but some of the episodes are going to be long, like this one was. So it'll make up for it in the end, hopefully. They've got a lot of work to do to wrap all of this up in one season, I feel like, personally. I feel like there's a lot of things that we need to know, that we need to see play out. So I am looking forward to that. Um, hopefully, I've heard rumors that it might be late 2018 instead of 2019. So we might get it sooner rather than later. One can only hope. I am the one hoping because <laughs> I have very little patience. As you've seen, I'm very impatient when it comes to stuff like this. 
I have to keep myself occupied watching other things. So let me know what you're watching. I'll let you know what I'm watching right now. And uh, we'll talk. Fear the Walking Dead starts soon. Walking Dead comes back soon. There's this show Outlander that I've gotten into that comes back soon. Um, I just got into Salem. It's a Fox show that's already been canceled, but I found it. And uh, I'm actually enjoying that. So let me know what you're into, and we'll talk. And I will see you all later. Night, guys.